Hi and welcome to this video about Task Manager. Obviously Task Manager is very familiar to many people. Let's see if we can see some of its more interesting features perhaps. So let's start with Task Manager by pressing Ctrl Shift Escape to launch Task Manager. If it's the first time you're launching Task Manager you'll see something like this, just a very shortened look, set of applications so to speak. Let's just click the more details button to see some more information and we are greeted with this processes tab. So this processes tab indeed includes processes and they are segregated in several ways such as having child processes within parent processes and all these kinds of stuff which is sometimes useful but I'd rather take a look at a flat list of processes here and also note that if I right click here there is a limited set of columns I can see for processes so I'm going to switch to the details view to see a flat list of processes, at least for the purpose of this video. And first perhaps it's a good idea to talk about the name Task Manager. What does the name Task actually mean? Does Windows support tasks? Does it, is, is what we see here are actually tasks? Well, no, these are processes. The name Task Manager is a relic from 16-bit Windows where tasks were the object that was used to manage the application's uh, instance, so to speak, what we're familiar with today as processes. It's not the same thing, but it's kind of the same thing from a conceptual perspective, but the name remains, so it's Task Manager, even though it should actually be being called Process Manager in today's Windows. Anyway, we'll just keep calling it Task Manager. There are task entities in Windows, but they're completely unrelated. For example, there are tasks as part of the task scheduler service. But this is a completely different thing and completely unrelated to task manager or processes in general. So let's look at the columns that we see here in task manager. By default, maybe add a few more columns along the way. First, we have this column called name. And this provides some kind of name for the process, which is mostly the executable name. Now it's important to realize that an executable name does not represent the unique way to identify a process. This is the job of the process ID or PID. This number is unique to a process for as long as that process is alive. But we still see the process name which of course is useful when we try to figure out what the process is actually running. So you might have multiple processes running exactly the same image, the same executable image which is completely fine of course. There are some special processes, if I sort by process ID, that don't have executable names associated with them, such as the system process here with the process ID of 4. This represents everything that's going on in kernel space, so that's representing all the drivers, the, the kernel, uh, the handles that the kernel and device drivers are using. Everything that is in kernel space is represented by this system process. Secure system represents the secure kernel which is available if you have virtualization-based security feature enabled, which is a topic for a completely different video. We also have the registry process, which is used to store information, cache information about the registry, instead of being stored in some page pool within kernel space. There's also the idle process, and something which is called here system interrupts, which is completely unrelated to process sets, not a process at all, just a way to provide some CPU time representing times where the processor or processors are at high interrupt request level, something we'll perhaps discuss in a different video. Anyway, the way to distinguish processes is using this process ID, which is fairly understandable. And then we have this curious status column, which is kind of weird. In most cases, we see here the value running. We can see here it says running. But looking at the CPU consumption for most of these processes, it seems to be completely zero. So what is exactly running here? It doesn't really make uh, much sense. And if we see running here, what are the other options? So here's one option. Let me launch the Windows calculator. So here's calculator on my Windows 10 machine here. It looks like a nice calculator. Let me find it here in the list of processes. So it's called calculator app on my Windows 10 machine. You can see that it is running, whatever that may be. And then I can go ahead and minimize calculator. If I do that, you'll notice the status has changed to suspended. Essentially, all the threads in calculator are now suspended, which means there's no CPU activity in that process, no matter what. 
If I go ahead and restore calculator, you'll notice the status changes back to running. So we have, before we actually explain what running is, we at least have some other value we can look at, which is suspended, which is exactly about having all the threads in the process completely suspended. The most common case for this kind of behavior is for universal Windows platform applications, UWP applications. Most of these applications you can download from the Microsoft Store. So Calculator is one of those, but there are many others like Bing Weather, and you can see here Cortana also being suspended at this point on my system. And so these kinds of processes have this special management on top of them, so when they are in the background or minimized, they get forcefully suspended so that they don't they don't consume any CPU time. This is very similar to the mobile platforms you might be familiar with. When you have a mobile application that you launch an application, then the previous one goes into the background, it's being suspended by the operating system, not necessarily Windows, of course. That's kind of the same behavior we get here for these kinds of processes. What about other possible values? We have running, which we have yet to explain properly. We also have suspended, but what about other values? Are there any va other values that you might be familiar with? And you've definitely seen that there's in fact one more value. And that value is called not responding. And this is the case where you have some application whose window or windows seem to be not responding to any kind of input. And so here's an example. I've created an application here called Hang App. Not a very exciting name. Here it goes. It just uh, shows us a window with a nice button. If I go ahead and click that button, let me first bring that Hang App process into view. Here it goes. Here's the process. It's currently running, whatever that may be. And I'm going to click this button. I'm going to click this button. And after five seconds, you notice that the process would become not responding. And you can see I can't really do anything with this process, with this window to be more precise. Uh, and we get not responding here shown in the title bar for a few seconds and then it goes back to being responsive. So really, when you see not responding is the case where you have a process that has a thread that has some kind of user interface and that thread hasn't checked its message queue related to that user interface for at least five seconds. This is when Task Manager concludes that the application or the process is not responding. So it's not really about the process, it's actually about the thread, but uh, in most cases we have a single thread that manages user interface in the process, that's the most common case, and this is what Task Manager is looking at. Again, I'm going to click that, and after five seconds of being blocked and not being able to do anything, we'll get not responding here, not responding in the title bar. And in this case, I'm just doing a simple slip within uh, this, uh, this code when the button is clicked, and that slip is limited to about 13 seconds. So after that time elapsed, then when that elapses, we get back to the responding state. But obviously, in many cases, when you see that, usually you just go to the end task button, which will uh, cause the process to terminate if you can do that, if you're able to do that. So these are the three possible values for status. So now we can summarize that. So if the process has user interface, running means responding. Otherwise, if it's not responding, we'll see not responding. If all the threads are suspended in the process, we'll see suspended. In all other cases, we'll see running. Put in a different way, if the process has no user interface, it's always going to be in the running status, whatever that may be, which essentially means Windows has no idea or Task Manager has no idea what this process is doing. It might be running like crazy. It might be doing nothing. It doesn't matter. Since it has no user interface, Windows has no idea what the pr purpose of this process is. It's always going to show here the term running. And this is used for, well, normal users that think, well, I have many applications here. They seem to be running. Well, great. I mean, that's what I want to see on my system, right? So it's really about processes and about user interface. So let's uh, continue with other columns. We have the username, which represents the user or the access token behind the scenes that is used for security purposes. So if a process here tries to gain access to some external resource, such as a file, then the access token based on that user will come into play and this and would be factored as a way to see whether you're able to get access to the resource that you want. 
So in many cases we see here processes running under my logged in user, but there are some, some special users that Windows provides, such as local system, local service, and network service that are typically used to run Windows services, something we might discuss in a different video. Then we have a session ID. Normally we have two sessions. Session zero always exists. This is where system processes run, processes that are used to manage a Windows, such as the session manager, uh, WinLogon and things like that. Well, actually WinLogon is not really uh, that kind of case here. In fact, it runs in session one uh, because it runs in the logged in uh, user session. So other stuff like WinInit, I mentioned SMSS and other such processes like the service control manager, they all run in session zero and then session one is used for the first uh, logged in user session. And then if another user is logged in um, locally or remotely, it will get session two and so on. And I'll perhaps uh, dive into sessions in a different video in a bit more detail. Then we have the CPU time consumption here, the CPU percentage, which is fairly understandable. Then we have some stuff related to memory. So memory here, we have this kind of column shown by default by task manager, which unfortunately is a very bad column to look at, but it is the one that is shown. So people mostly use that column to try to figure out how much memory process actually consumes which uh, is not the best idea. So here's why. It says active private working set. Working set means RAM, the actual RAM being consumed by the process. And that's really the problem with this counter because I may have allocated say one gigabyte of memory and, and only 100 megabyte is currently in RAM. So how much memory am I actually consuming? And the answer is one gigabyte, meaning there's lot less memory left for the other processes in the system to be able to use um, memory as they see fit. And so that's the problem with this particular counter. It only deals with RAM, which is something that most people find, it, find easier to understand. And I guess that's why this counter is being used, but it's actually not a good counter to use. I'll show you in a moment what the good counter to use is. And then we have private. This is private memory, which means it doesn't contain shared memory in this counter. Shared memory are things like DLLs. And that's actually a good thing because DLLs have fixed size, which is out of our control. So we don't really care that much as, as to how much memory these DLLs consume within the process because it is out of our control. We mostly care about the private memory that's being created and allocated and used in the process. And then we have active. Active is another silly addition process uh, task manager here added uh, at some point in, in one of the Windows 10 uh, versions, like I think the third version of Windows 10, where for UWP processes, where all the threads are suspended, the memory is going to be reported as zero. So notice, for example, here, I'm going to go to my calculator here, and you can see it consumes zero. Uh, obviously, it doesn't really consume zero, but it's going to be shown as zero every time it is suspended. So now it's not suspended, we'll see something, I'm going to minimize, we're going to see zero. In fact, there's another column which we can right click and go to select columns here that has exactly the same name just without the, the, the name active. So just private working set. We can see that indeed uh, all these values are exactly identical except for UWP processes where you'll find zero if the process is suspended and otherwise we'll see some value. So in fact, that's the actual RAM being currently consumed by calculator. It's not really zero, but it gives us a sense that if that RAM is needed for other purp purposes, then it can be repurposed immediately because calculator doesn't really need its memory right now. It is suspended after all. So that's that. Now, why is this, isn't that a good counter? Both of these counters are not really good because of that working set thing. So the correct counter to look at is called commit size. So here goes commit size. That's the thing we need to add to task manager. This shows the private memory, still private memory, but the entire private memory, regardless of how much is currently in RAM or not, because these things are fluctuating all the time. So just looking at the RAM is not good enough. Let me do a little sorting here. You can see that in some cases we have values which are very close. So for example, this one drive process, which apparently consumes lots and lots of memory, almost two gigabyte, which is kind of alarming. You can see most of its memory is in physical memory, in RAM right now, probably because it, it is fairly active and my system has enough RAM to go around. So some other processes that have similar uh, statistics here, but in other cases, you might see big differences between 
a virtual or the commit size, the virtual address space for private memory is being consumed by a process compared to its RAM consumption. So here's one example here. There's a web view something uh, process here, which allocated and committed almost 400 megabytes, but as it happens right now, only 44 megabytes are in RAM because probably this process wasn't running lots of code recently. But it doesn't mean that it consumes only 44, it actually consumes 400 megabytes, which, which contributes to the memory consumption of the system. And if you go to performance for a moment to memory, we can see here the committed size currently 52 gigabytes and after the slash the commit limit. This is how much I can commit on my system before I run out or I'll have page files extended if, if indeed they're configured to do so. And so if I allocate one gigabyte, even if currently none of that is in RAM, still this number will be increased to 53, which means there's less memory for other processes in the system. So obviously at this uh, stage, my system is fairly uh, nice and is not really strained in terms of memory, but in general, this is something you want to look at. Always commit size, never look at the active private working set or without the active, doesn't matter. Both of these are in fact bad. So this is the memory stuff. Then we have platform, which represents the fact that this process each one of these processes is either 32-bit or 64-bit, and there's a description which is coming from the PE. You can also, of course, add some more columns here to make it uh, perhaps a bit more interesting. We can add the number of threads in the process and number of handles in the process as well. So first, let's talk about threads. So threads are the actual entities executing code. You can see there are many threads per process. It doesn't necessarily mean that this is the way it should be, but this is the way that it is right now. So for example, this explore process has 174 threads, but the CPU consumption is zero, which begs the question, why are there so many threads? And unfortunately, the answer is not a very good reason. And then we have the number of threads here, which is the maximum or the seems to be the highest number here for the system process. This is uh, about threads created by the kernel or kernel device drivers. You can see other processes with their thread count. We expect number of threads to be at least one because without a thread, process is really useless. Threads are the ones actually getting CPU time and fighting for processors. So obviously we have lots of threads here, much more than they actually should be for processes that are doing basically nothing, most of them. In fact, in the performance tab, if you go to CPU, you can see the statistics here. Currently, I have 7,000 something threads on my system. The CPU utilization is about 30, 35%. Let's just call that 30 for convenience, which means at any given point in time, only roughly five threads on my system are actually running. All the others are waiting, essentially doing nothing. And that's because I have 16 logical processors on my system. So at any given point in time, 16 threads are the maximum number of threads that can run at any given point in time. And at this point, roughly uh, just a third of those are running about five threads. And then we have handles. Handle is about the entities that allow us to communicate with kernel objects. So every process has its own handle table. So we can see here in task manager just how many handles each process has open to various kernel objects like processes, mutexes, files, semaphores, and so on. We don't get any details here as to which handle points to which object, but we just get the statistics here for those kinds of details. We'll have to use more sophisticated tools such as Process Explorer from sysinternals, which we might take a look at in a different video. So that's uh, the basics of Task Manager. You can go ahead and right click and select more columns if you feel like examining other features of processes, some of which you might discuss in a future video. I hope you enjoyed it. That's a very quick overview of Task Manager. See you in the next video.